Hello, denizens of the internet. I know, I promised to disappear for the holidays for my own sanity, but I've been drawn out because of the insanity that was Zack Snyder's Rebel Moon Part 1, a show so egregiously awful, such a piece of garbage that I think we now have a new category of wretched excess that goes nowhere. I wonder how this birth defect actually got past Netflix's blood tests, ultrasound, the amniocentesis, and finally given birth through a C-section because this monstrous overstuffed colossus of crap was not going to come out as anything resembling a natural birth. Watching Rebel Moon caused me to flash back to other examples of a gargantuan decrepitude like Wonder Woman 1984, Ghostbusters 2016, The Flash, Thor, Love and Thunder, Ghosted, The Little Mermaid, Shang-Chi, Obi-Wan, oh, the list is endless. But by my recollection of those as bad, as misguided as they were, they were at least about something. Rebel Moon is not really much about anything. Ships from the mother world land on a tiny speck of a farming planet floating in the galaxy in the shadow of something resembling Saturn that looked more like a computer screensaver. Its grain output wouldn't be enough to supply buns to a single McDonald's franchise for lunch. And this is where Atticus Noble, who is anything but I get it. Played in ultra evil mode by Ed Skrine, made up to look like Jim Carrey from Dumb and Dumber, lands with his fleet of space destroyers to steal its harvest? There wasn't a more populous, more successful farming planet in the entire system to bully? This movie was just so stupid. We meet Cora, the fierce girl boss played by Sofia Butella, which honestly was the only decent thing about Rebel Moon. I was totally prepared for an evening of girl boss eye rolling <laughs> that would let me familiarize myself with the occipital lobe of my brain as I was endlessly forced to stare at it. But I liked her character and I would have liked her even more if they would have just let her wash her face occasionally. Was there a soap embargo in the galaxy? So, I won't bore you with details, but nice dude gets beaten to death by Lloyd Christmas. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, I meant Atticus, who takes off, leaving his incoherently rapey men to, what else? Try to get rapey with a beautiful young thing who moments earlier befriended a robot named Jimmy, incongruously voiced by Anthony Hopkins. I'm, I'm glad he's getting work, though. Cora prepares to run away, of course, but uh, turns back to kick ass, which she does in glorious Snyder Scoop slow-mo. It all ends with super rapey leader holding the victim hostage only to be killed by Jimmy, who we were told earlier was no longer capable of killing. Perhaps the only interesting character who will not figure into the story again is Zack saving him for part two. Cora changes her mind about saving this shithole and decides to go on a journey to find mercenaries willing to defend the corner store. Mandatory bar fight scene, Kai, played by Charlie Hunam, to, to the rescue. They bond. Of course, he has a spaceship. My first thought was, he's going to be the traitor. Lazy action writers always throw in traitors, while it worked a treat in The Matrix, the Wachowskis could just not lay off the crack for its sequels. Next followed some exceedingly stupid, unmotivated set pieces as Korra and Gunnar search for their heroes. They pick up Tarak, the hippogriff trainer, the flaming ninja sword-wielding nemesis who kills a horrific spider creature who it turned out was just defending her planet from the mining pollution. <laughs> no fault of her own. They pick up a drunk General Titus, blood axe. I, I can't recall who else, but it doesn't matter. We do get some flashbacks to when Cora was a member of the mother world with her butch haircut, with its soldiers wearing embroidered uniforms that would have made Muammar Gaddafi proud. Snyder, 
loves his overstuffed militarism. Anyway, uh, Atticus discovers where the rebels are. Kai turns out to be a traitor. Oh, shock. Gunnar is told to kill Korra, but turns on Kai, kills him, releases Korra. The heroes free themselves. Lots of pew, pew, pewing. Final fight between Korra and Atticus on some ugh, floaty thing. Atticus is defeated. The six samurai head towards the village through a field of wheat. Atticus Turns out to be an android is resurrected, told in a dream sequence to kill Korra, the end. While I will give Zack credit that Rebel Moon was not incoherent, it was easy to follow, it was so because it was childishly simplistic and derivative. Sure, you could say Star Wars A New Hope was for children, reminiscent of the old Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers serials, but it wasn't childish. Rebel Moon had zero drama. No relationships. Snyder handled the assembly of uh, the samurai characters like moving checkers pieces. And there I say that, that would have been more engrossing. I'm trying to recall just what took up the two hour running time. A New Hope was an hour and 45 minutes long. And it was packed with character building, adventure, and near escapes that we discuss 46 plus years later and it wasn't a very complicated story. I have no idea what Netflix was thinking when it greenlit Rebel Moon. Did anyone on their staff actually read Snyder's script? Apparently, it was 200 pages long. Yes, eight pages of dialogue and 192 pages of describing the visual effects and slow-mo. For the most part, I rarely tell people to not see something. Most creative efforts are often in the eye of the beholder. I thought Arcane, except for its groundbreaking animation, was a waste of time. But did I get an earful? I'm not expecting any blowback from the Snyderverse fans, because even they have to be embarrassed by this ill-conceived waste of time. Till next time, denizens. Be seeing you. Now I'm going to go back on my break. <laughs>